Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you for staying on and welcome to this last panel of the day. And maybe it's just my ears and how they're tuned in, but I've heard MRV and standards throughout our discussions, not just on stage. That just there is this big need. I've heard that those carbon removals are not really that visible or <laughs> hard to grab, and we need to something in our hands. So really the product that bundles them together and makes them accessible for buyers is basically the work of, of MRV. And we need to, to figure out where it lives and who contributes to it and how that works. And uh, yeah, my, maybe also a little piece of, of hope that I can share is that I just joined this, this space and, and the carbon market domain three months ago. And it was so great <laughs> to, to to have this community being so welcoming and open and sharing their knowledge and their enthusiasm and, and it was so easy to, to get in here and this is a piece of hope that I really think we can get millions and millions of other people attracted and, and joining this space. So thank you for that. Thank you for your generosity of, of sharing information. Um, I still have lots of questions left so I, I'm happy to have this role because I have a wonderful panel group here. So we have Marianne Tikanen from Puro Earth Registry and Standard coming from Finland to us. Yeah, okay, here is not an, an easy trip. <laughs> and then we have Hans-Peter Schmidt from the Itaka Institute, and he will also be able to speak about the European Biochar Certificate and the Carbon Standards International because they are collaborating closely from Switzerland. And we have Travis Caddy from C-Capsule. It's a, a new CDR standard based in the UK. Travis came from London. Thank you for being here. And then we have my dear colleague, Berta Moya. She's part of the supply team in Carbon Future, and she heads our Catalyst program. We heard about it already. So there she helps, and all of we try to contribute to develop methodologies for emerging CDR technologies. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Let's give them a warm round of applause. And I'm still standing because I have one slide. It's just one that I would like to present to you and give some, some context and also some visuals because I really love them. And it is nothing new. And it's really just giving a, a picture of this chronological journey of the, like the, the track through the validation and verification cycle from a product, from a project initiation until the issuance of credits and retirement. Um, and we have a couple of actors around it, so let me walk you through that quickly. So we have on the one side suppliers, and we've seen a couple of exciting examples. We have three more. Um, they really do climate action. So in the biochar case, it was, would be the producers of biochar, but also the end users, so the ones that sequester biochar into the soil or into products. Those guys do CDR. And they are empowered and enabled by the buyers of the carbon credits on the other side. And we believe that to link those two parties, to have a link between supply and demand, we need something that reaches both of them. And for now, this is just this green blob, and it, it's twofold in its layers. It has one role that is focusing more on the data, shepherding data, collecting data, being a digital MRV system, so tracking the carbon from the air to the ground, translate, we're helping to translate into removal credits um, and, and providing this whole track in this direction. And then the other direction we heard about this a lot too is a marketplace or a, a trading service. And again, this could be different actors. It could be interlinked systems. Um, and there we have things like pre-purchase agreements, offtake for a couple of years and all these things that we really need to drive the market. And this is something that is separate from the standard. And the roles of the standard, that's overarching up there. And what they do is they define process and quality parameters within their methodologies that are written for a specific type of removal. And they'll develop them or have them developed by others. And then when the project comes on, it will be initiated, it will be assessed based on the requirements of the methodology by project developers or by the suppliers themselves or by others. And then we have the first checkpoint where a VVB, a validation and verification body, um, looks at 
the whole documentation of the scoping and the planning of the project and compares it to the rules as given it by the standard. And if that's compatible, if that's a match, then they get a check. They go through registration with the standard. And again, this is crude overview. It could look different for the different standards. And then we go into project, op project operation. So the carbon removal credits get churned out. And we have the time where the monitoring really starts. We have this tracking being filled with data consistently. And then we have the next point where, based on the output, then the magic happens of this translation of, of climate action into the carbon credit. And that happens typically something that the standard does or overviews. And it could be, again, a VVB coming in, doing the verification, and then the standard checks on, off on it and writes the credits into the registry. Um, so we see that those different roles of a standard are definitely having methodologies ready, governing over them, um, operating a registry, and then accrediting the VVBs, making sure that they know how to do that and understand the rules, and also accrediting this DM DMRV system, whoever operates it. So that is sort of the jobs that we see in the space, and, and of course this will change and emerge still. And then we have the credit issuance, um, and there are still some services to be done, portfolio services. We heard from the buyers that they don't want to buy just one project and all of the credits from there, so they want a good mix. They want, they want them really to be packaged in a way that is good for them. So this is just as a, as a context. Um, and I'll, I'd like to leave you with that, and, and we'll go into introductions now. So um, let's start with this question of where do you see the entity that you represent within this? Or like, we can move this away now, we don't need it anymore. And where is your role in the entity? So we'll start with Marianne. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for Carbon Future for organizing this uh, excellent networking event. So uh, very many known faces uh, here for me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Marianne Tikkanen is my name from Puro.Earth. Uh, my role in Puro is head of carbon crediting uh, program, uh, which is uh, almost the same as uh, what the standard was standing uh, here for. Uh, the EU CRCF uses crediting scheme, so that's what we are. Uh, operate a registry um, and uh, have uh, five methodologies. Actually, when I made my notes of what Puro is, mm. I got fours and fives. Uh, we have uh, projects or suppliers in five continents that are already uh, certified and, and registered and have received carbon credits. Uh, we have five methods, so the two fives. Uh, all of them are industrial uh, removals, so that's the niche where we play. And we probably come back to those uh, yeah, okay. later. Uh, then we have uh, employees in four continents. I have my European colleague Benno here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we have been four years in this business. So our first uh, biochar credits were issued May 2019. Mm -hmm. So that makes us a veteran in carbon removals. Definitely. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and. Let's go over to, to, to another veteran in carbon removals, definitely someone who helped shape this field. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Hans-Peter Schmidt uh, from the Ithaca Institute. We started with, with biochar research uh, in 2007. We did the first European biochar field trial. And from there, I accompanied uh, the, the biochar world uh, with 2011, creating the EBC, the European Biochar Certificate, which was the material standard to, um, to, um, to guarantee that no harm is done to, to soil when you apply the biochar, mm -hmm. which was very important at this point because nobody knew what biochar is and if, if you, can, you can apply it. Um, and we run the EBC first with two companies and then four companies and then Slowly it started, and suddenly uh, Marianne and Antti, her colleague, <laughs> they called and said, could you give us the biochar? We want to make sinks out of it. <laughs> and then I said, 
how you want to do this? And that was the point which was clear now we need also the carbon sink certificate. So um, it was her fault <laughs> because I thought uh, industry is not ready to make the certification yet. But because you pushed it, we had to do it. And in the end, we have two different mm. uh, certificates, uh, which is good. Um, it's inspiring. Um, and we continued uh, on this carbon sink certification development with the Ithaca Institute, but it became too big to run these this, uh, certificates and, and, and the whole <coughs> process. So that was sold to the company, the EasyCert Group, uh, with Uli Steiner, who is in the audience, <laughs> um, and uh, founded the Carbon Standard International organization, who runs now all these carbon sink standards that the Ithaca still develops. So we have biochar, enhanced weathering, uh, working on uh, tree uh, certification with single tree tracking, uh, with uh, inspiring <laughs> um, partners, and started the artisanal thing. So we, we try to create, uh, um, I mean, in a certain way, like Pura also do, uh, um, a home for all carbon sinks. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. What about you, Trev? <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, and thank you, Carbon Future, for hosting this wonderful event. Um, so my name is Travis Caddy. I work for an organization called Evident. Uh, we build registries to certify the world's clean economy, and we also co-develop uh, certification standards. Uh, we started this uh, process back in 2014. Uh, we developed the IREC mechanism, the International Renewable Energy Certificate, um, and that has grown uh, to uh, yeah, 50 countries uh, worldwide. We have 18,000 end users across 140 countries. Um, and because of the success of that market, we wanted to um, apply the same principles and procedures for certification to other environmental asset classes. Um, so we started to diversify our portfolio. We're now certifying low methane natural gas under the MIQ standard. Uh, and then we also um, very recently co-founded Sea Capsule, which is a new standard uh, for certifying uh, durable carbon removal, very similar to CSI and, and Puro. Effectively, one Sea Capsule certificate will equal um, one net ton of carbon removed from the atmosphere. And we're looking now to host um, methodologies um, for durable carbon removal, so anything from biochar upwards to um, mineralization. Um, and I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you so much. And then, great. Um, yeah, so I'm <laughs> Berta Moya from Carbon Future. Um, I'm not sure I need to introduce Carbon Future if you're all here, it's because <laughs> you know us, which is great. Um, and maybe more to like, where we stand in that diagram that you showed, Anna, I would, I would say that um, I see ourselves a bit like the, maybe like the extroverted friend that like interacts with everyone and like provides like uh, hosts, uh, you know, interactions between everyone, everyone being like the standards um, or like the verification bodies as well and the suppliers. So um, through our tracking platform, um, everyone can come and see the data and verify it and make sure that the carbon credits that are generated are fully transparent and traceable, and which I think we all agree. And it's been great to hear all about throughout today um, how important that is for everyone to have, you know, robust and, and trustworthy market that we're all building together. Um, and maybe also uh, mentioning that at Carbon Futures, so I work on the supply team, so working a lot with. Um, companies that develop uh, carbon removal approaches, um, a lot with biochar, but also um, I'm leading our Catalyst program, which is where we engage uh, with carbon removal approaches that don't yet have methodologies under third-party standards. Um, and so seeing how we can help companies work together in developing like more robust MRV, also initiate methodology development processes to um, yeah, move the, the industry fast, uh, well, faster, um, and make sure that these uh, new approaches also uh, are developed in a robust, transparent way, and how they can um, be included in, in standards um, in a 
more lean and fast way. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for including a bit of history. So that was exciting to hear. The next question I would like to ask to all of you is, is how do credits come into the market through the scheme you're representing here? Maybe you can say that quickly, and then we can also touch on how the governance is different, and maybe what exactly is the difference between a verification authority and a standard holder? <laughs> a bit of that. Many <laughs> questions there, but <laughs> if we start with uh, how do uh, credits come to the market in our um, uh, case uh, in Puro Earth. So uh, carbon removal credits are always issued to the uh, supplier. Supplier has an account in the um, registry or if they have authorized another uh, developer or uh, bank or somebody to hold their account, then that is the account where the credits go. And uh, the supplier or the authorized uh, account custodian is the holder who makes the decision. So they are free to use any venue, uh, any sales channel, carbon future uh, patch um, exchange mm -hmm. uh, to uh, put their credits out in the market. Very many uh, in the early years have uh, done direct uh, pre-purchase agreements uh, and found their first buyers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is still happening. So uh, bilateral agreements mm -hmm. on spot or uh, pre-purchase um, commitments are are also common, uh, so it's fully in the hands of the credit owner uh, whose account it is in. Okay, great. That is what is what is the path? Yeah, I think very similar to to Pure. Obviously, a supplier needs to be um, to have their facility uh, verified against an approved uh, methodology, um, and then once the issuing body is satisfied with that. Um, validation and verification, they can create the facility on the evident registry. And as soon as they can start uh, demonstrating that they have uh, verifiably removed carbon from the atmosphere, the issuer can start creating certificates in the registry that can go on for onward uh, trade or, or ultimate redemption against an end user beneficiary. Um, our principles for certification is, is ex post and fact based. So um, only issuing verified historical facts. We're not looking to do any sort of uh, ex-ante issuance. Um, this doesn't mean to say that we don't support pre-purchase agreements. It's that the just the certificate can only be created on the registry once the carbon has actually been removed and ultimately verified. Mm -hmm. Would you like to include something about governance? I think that's interesting. Sure, yeah, what definitely. So yeah, we have a very unique uh, governance structure. Um, C Capsule itself, um, it is effectively a code manager. And what we are doing is applying um, the international attribute tracking standard, which is held by a foundation, not-for-profit foundation in the Netherlands. Um, we are applying that standard um, according to durable carbon removal. And they are the ultimate governance body that will approve methodologies that can be used within C Capsule. Um, that board is comprised of uh, electricity, energy, attribute tracking experts to date. What we're now working on is the development of an advisory council as well to sit between ourselves, C Capsule, and the Art Foundation board, um, who can provide a more kind of informed insight as to the credibility of uh, novel uh, or existing CDR methodologies. Mm -hmm. So this is, to me, it's very interesting to really dissect of what we are allowed to do. I mean, obviously there are no laws on this, but, but what is acceptable to the society or where do we need division of powers and what is something that actually helps to delegate? So maybe Betsa, do you know, uh, from your perspective, where are there conflicts of interest that you think we need to avoid? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think um, like the main conflicts of interest that we see maybe is like um, where um, yeah, who is, the, in terms of data, um, who is hosting the data, w what is hosted by a third party, how it's verified, um, who verifies it and, and when, and mm -hmm. um, who is, like, setting the rules, so, like, the methodologies, like, having that governance, like, that you show, like, this is an ideal case, um, is not always in place mm -hmm. um, in, in the market. Um, and so I think uh, having three 
different independent stakeholders come into play to generate a credit is really like the, the minimum that is, that is needed to make sure that there's the checks and balances um, in place. And also the financial incentives um, are another. Mm -hmm. And another the three would be without the buyer or with? <laughs> um, without the buyer. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hans-Peter, how, how do you see that? Or maybe really that those fundamental values that are behind operating standards. What do we need to pay attention to? Yeah, we, we talked, uh, I think Hannes said it, it's about the trust. And that's, that's what we discussed since the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's the trust because uh, when you create a standard, you do not have anything else. And also we need to establish a standard mm -hmm. uh, before even the industry starts to invest. And and before policy mm -hmm. comes into yeah, play. Yeah, we heard about that. <laughs> and, um, and before you have a buyer. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to invest into something uh, that does not really exist yet. I mean, kind of. Mm -hmm. And now, how do you do that, that, that you can change it over time? Because you start at the moment when it's clear it will not be the same thing in five years. Mm -hmm. But if you have over-regulation, uh, that every time it takes about a year uh, to get a change through all the instances, then, then you cannot create innovative standards. Mm -hmm. so, so our base is always, we make things that are science-proof and it's trustworthy, even if it sounds hard sometimes, mm -hmm. that you do not allow it something because you say, yeah, but you simply didn't calculate it correct. But in the long term, this is the only thing that helps us to go on the long term is um, ma make your balance sheets right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, yeah, please. Yeah, I was just going to add on that point about trust. The, the way we see um, trust in the market is separation and, and independence. Mm -hmm. um, so having you know clear separation of roles, um, whether it be the standard setter, the issuing body, the registry provider, um, the marketplace. And so within our governance framework, um, each market facilitator, whether you're an issuer, um, you are a, a standard, uh, a registry, they all have to be accredited mm -hmm. by our overarching umbrella governance mm -hmm. body, which is the ARIC Foundation. Um, and that ensures that every market facilitator doesn't have a play an active role in the market. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I didn't tell how governance right. in uh, a <laughs> standard is uh, managed, so we haven't... Uh, so advisory board independent um, headed by or chaired by uh, professor miles allen from oxford university uh, with other um, scientific members mm. in the board so that's the ultimate decision body where the standard and methodologies mm -hmm. are changed uh, and then of course the uh, independent verifiers who then check that those standard rules are followed uh, by the uh, projects and like you showed in the, in the um, slide uh, validation to check the eligibility when they enter the program and then annual or 12 months mm -hmm. um, apart um, performance checks that they really report their that year's removal according to mm -hmm. the uh, plan but um, yeah on, on that uh, sort of uh, conflict of interest so uh, I think that these standards are basically the buyer's joint due diligence on the project. Mm -hmm. So there is some kind of uh, joint uh, agreement or the buyers who buy these credits through these standards have uh, mm -hmm. accepted that these are the rules that are good for me mm -hmm. now. And it is true that this world is really quickly changing. And that is problematic. We have not had to do um, pivots in 180 degrees, but we've done uh, evolution mm -hmm. in changing, for example, uh, the permanence rule that uh, currently our minimum durability for the storage is 100 years. We started at 50 years. And now uh, three out of five of our methodologies have the over 1,000 year storage durability. So this kind of gradual changes mm -hmm. have happened. Changes are hard mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. for industrial projects. Uh, like uh, Venna here earlier said, mm. uh, you invest for 10 years, sometimes 20 or 40 years. We both have background in energy industry where 40 years is not a strange investment mm -hmm. uh, length. And changing rules every two years, every five years <laughs> Don't like it. is a problem. <laughs> so I do hope that um, uh, EU gets, gets an agreement that uh, could be stable yeah. grounds yeah. for uh, for ten yeah. tens of years. And about the accreditation, we've just been accredited or endorsed by ICROA a couple of months ago. So every party needs to do that, and and yeah. uh, it's a good check, I must say. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, we'll have to decide. I think as a, as an industry, if that is enough or whatever else we need to have enough data. And, and I think what, what you raised also, you had the scientific advisory board, and we can talk about that a bit more when we switch over to methodologies, but just the need of having a, a multi-stakeholder process of accompanying, like of following up with the changes that you do, and moderating them, and to make sure that we also have, not just with the buyers, the, I like the due diligence <laughs> comparison, but also have a larger societal acceptance of mm -hmm. what what the hell we're doing there <laughs> like, to also avoid uh, crises and, and fraud just popping up out of nowhere yeah great so my next question would be to all of you um, just to get more of a feeling for the audience of what it is that you really are working on most of your time so what are the top two activities or three that you maybe not personally but as an entity spend time for on like what do you do what stakeholders do you engage with what are the activities that you do hans peter maybe you start excel files writing <laughs> texts <laughs> <laughs> what would you say writing standards <laughs> yeah yeah um writing standards becomes more and more fun <laughs> um i never thought this <laughs> um and, and creating the calculations mm -hmm. that are behind, um, that becomes more and more passion. Mm -hmm. um, also because now we talk about carbon balances and we are now moving more to, to radiative forcing mm -hmm. as, as the balancing standard. And that becomes super fun because um, the formula becomes more complicated. Mm. <laughs> and you like complicated formula, right? <laughs> so we just, uh, we, we, we need more mathematicians now yeah. and less people that understand agriculture. Um, the PhD physics. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the short answer. Cool, yeah. And maybe, yeah, from everyone, I'd love to hear what are, what are the big chunks of your... <coughs> yeah, so um, Puro Earth is... Um, I would say a factory, so minting credits is the core. Uh, and how does that happen? First, there needs to be a methodology. So we have been the pioneer of uh, bringing these crazy CDR methodologies. Mm -hmm. Biochar was crazy in 2019 uh, when it was created. It didn't have uh, acceptance. Uh, now it has, and that has happened in three, four years. Mm -hmm. So let's hope that the rest follow mm -hmm. suit and, and uh, enhanced rock weathering has been the latest that we've, we've um, announced as a uh, methodology. The first uh, projects are being uh, through the funnel of uh, validation mm -hmm. now and uh, let's hope that it will get to the mainstream acceptance where it is not yet today mm -hmm. through these uh, works. But uh, yeah, this uh, funnel of uh, when the methodology is there, uh, then um, having the validation, verification, mm -hmm. the uh, control of all that. certification mm -hmm. uh, work yeah. done. Yeah, Travis, what is? What yeah, is great question. Busy? What's keeping me busy? What's keeping me <laughs> up at night? Um, if not being on panel. Yeah, very much <laughs> creating a <laughs> very much creating a route to market for all the suppliers and, and buyers that we're talking to at the moment. So. Um, coordinating with, with several pilot uh, projects, uh, methodology developers, suppliers, providing a route to market through C-Capture certification and, and our registry, um, talking with our tech team about how we can build the best registry possible, mm -hmm. um, and then finally gaining acceptance 
you know, acceptance both in the uh, voluntary carbon market. You mentioned ICROA is one of the, the leading standards, but there are also various other rule setters in the space. Uh, we've heard a few mentioned today, SPTI, mm -hmm. ICVCM, making sure that we are aligning with those standards. Um, and also compliance as well. This is the, the, the primary driver and, and market for removals, I think. Um, so understanding how we can uh, work with governments to deliver um, their certification and, and compliance markets, ETS, um, and beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, Tim, what would you say? Maybe within Catalyst mostly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe within Catalyst, um, I would say I spend a lot of my time um, having great conversations with companies that are developing novel approaches to CDR. Um, some more like known like enhanced weathering, some more like wild ideas out there that are maybe not quite ready. Um, but yeah, a lot of my time finding out about new new technologies and, and digging more into them. Um, and then also um, getting momentum and groups together to initiate methodology development. Um, and I mean, with you as well, interacting with standards to see how how we can move things faster mm -hmm. or like how we can develop methodologies in a more lean manner, like Hans-Peter mentioned, like we need uh, intermediate solutions maybe uh, for these approaches that still have some unknowns for the MRV, but do definitely need um, to have some methodologies um, in place. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say. Really. Good. Yeah. Good, good. yeah, I like that you say move things faster because I th that would be, I mean, the whole topic here is to, to speed up this process, and I, we learned that the standards task is to make things hard <laughs> and difficult and set some boundaries, and we also need speed. So maybe the next question would then be really to, within this trust ecosystem of, of proving carbon removal, how can we automate and streamline or delegate? How, how can we be faster? What do you think? Because probably people will think standards take an awful lot of time always. <laughs> so, and, and they have to take some time, they be, have to be rigorous, but how, mm -hmm. how can we get faster? Uh, I think that uh, industrial removals have a luxury problem that things can be measured. Mm -hmm. uh, the bains, baseline is very much easier. Normally, carbon is not being removed if the industrial project is not there. So uh, compared to uh, other offsets or biological uh, processes which are not controlled by engineers and, and industrial processes, uh, our ways of working are much easier to digitalize, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, put in platforms, automate. And I think that that is happening uh, more and more. Uh, of course, you need to do run the first uh, rounds uh, manually. Mm -hmm so that you then know what ca what should go to the platform. But uh, that, that is what we are uh, currently doing mm -hmm. with the ones that are older methodologies. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, so one, one thing is writing standards quicker. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of limited. We're, we're quite quick. Uh, but implement a standard. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, to for a company that, that gets the standard, um, that should not only be a burden. So, so we try to make it that when the companies get the standard and apply it to their processes, um, they learn also something about their processes and in the end improve it mm -hmm. uh, and, and like it because it's, uh, it's proper calculation. It's not like uh, I have this or that. Um, and, and, and often, you come with some illusions to, to the, the carbon sink market. Mm -hmm. You yeah. think it's, it's easier. Uh, but in the end, it's, um, it, it's, it's a pleasure to see uh, when your process that you establish with your industry uh, fits into, uh, into a framework that makes sense. Yeah. And then it, the time that you lose on it is not, is not really lost, it's, it's, it's your gain. So you're creating transparency also for them to see what they can optimize or be more efficient about yeah. it. Understand. Yeah, great. yeah, I think just building on, on the point that both yeah. Hans-Peter and, and Marianne have said, I think the luxury that we have with durable CDR is that it's a lot easier to mm. measure, um, monitor and verify than you know traditional offset methodologies where you're looking at a counterfactual baseline and so on. Um, and, but then I think building 
building on top of that, how can we automate the, the measurement reporting mm -hmm. verification, I think, mm -hmm. is, is the next stage. Um, so that we can create bankability for, for project developers yeah. much faster than, than currently is the, the standard today. So will there be a human in the loop or not? Or for more <laughs> how much longer, Piazza? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. With IoT, maybe no humans involved, just CDR happening. That would be great. Um, yeah, I think with um, in Carbon Future, with our, our platform, we're constantly um, looking at when we have a great product team who is also um, looking at how to improve the, the usability of the of the platform, but also interacting with um, standards and VVBs. I, I know I keep I keep uh, repeating it, but it <laughs> is what we do uh, to understand really what the needs are from different standards and different bodies to uh, what kind of data needs to be reported, what the data coming in looks like, what the data coming out looks like. To have uh, a digital platform where uh, all the the, cred the data is um, hosted and the credit can be generated mm -hmm. uh, from it um, yeah, digitally and in a more streamlined process. Yeah. yeah. I think there will always be a need for, for ultimate human verification. Yeah. Um, I think as much as we can automate data collection um, and, and digitization, a lot of people talk in the space about blockchain, you know, immediately, as soon as the removal has happened, can we create a credit? Um, in my opinion, no, we still need that kind of human layer of, mm -hmm. of verification at the issuer level just to ensure that the um, the actual, you know, uh, data aligns with, with the amount of, of, of C capsules or corks or, mm -hmm. or C sync credits actually align. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah well, well, we, we, we prepare that, that we do more kind of system accreditation mm -hmm. than, than controlling. That becomes the most important thing now because the more automatization we have, the more difficult it becomes uh, to control what it really does. It becomes black. Uh, and yeah. so we need, uh, we need new experts yeah. in, in doing this accreditation. And I think that that will be one key development in, the, in what we see yeah. next year. So that's good. If you know people who like rules and know data science, <laughs> get them in here. Yes, that's great. Let's move quickly into um, methodologies more. And just like we heard about some methodologies present on this stage already. Maybe you can briefly um, count them again. <laughs> yeah. Name them. The five ones. <laughs> yeah. If uh, I may start. So uh, geologically stored carbon. So our methodologies are storage focused. So uh, there needs to be the capture and storage. Uh, and uh, we have called geologically stored carbon where becks and ducts would go. Also, the, um, if you have a carbon containing liquid or substance that you put in a geological storage. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's one of them. Uh, maybe the first one when people think of industrial removals is mm -hmm. ducts and becks to a geological storage. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, biochar, uh, well known by now. Uh, then uh, the uh, terrestrial storage of biomass, uh, which is burying, digging, uh, covering biomass in engineered conditions where the um, decay of the biomass is uh, no, eliminated. So uh, it does not. Uh, and then the mineralization in closed um, system uh, called carbonated materials, where it's in an industrial setting or reactor, or then in the open system, which is then the enhanced rock weathering, mm -hmm. both carbon, uh, mineral carbonation processes. Right. Big bunch, thanks. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, essentially, <laughs> that's, that's um, it's, it's, um, we do not have the closed mineral, but the others uh, mm -hmm. is, is what we also wrote the standards for. Um, Maybe one additional point is that uh, we register the point of capture when, mm -hmm. whenever it happens, when comes the CO2 out of the atmosphere, because that's depending on, on the effect it has on the climate. Mm -hmm. um, and something we're working on is, um, is living biomass. So that, that is really is single tree tracking. That's, I think, super important game changer also to have um, not only things on the paper, but really measured mm -hmm. with the time of, of capture. 
And from there, the next step is making bio-based materials and certify also the carbon that is in materials with different life cycle um, expectations. Mm -hmm. So like a wooden table would have five to 10 years, a house 80 years, um, and, and from there build building systems where you can include uh, what's called short-term um, carbon sinks, but which we call rather temporary mm -hmm. carbon sinks yeah. that have to be renewed to have the same effect over time. Yeah, okay, yeah. great, thanks. Yeah, so it's slightly different um, approach. We, we don't develop the, the methodologies ourselves. Um, what we've produced and put out so far is, is clear guidelines for how methodologies um, can become approved under our standard. That is to ensure you know, very similar principles to, to Pure and CSI, that they are measurable, verifiable, additional, and durable over a minimum 100-year time horizon. Um, and then, of course, um, the correct environmental and social safeguards in place. Um, so taking a, a kind of bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. um, when we released our, our code um, and gained uh, accreditation to the attribute tracking standard towards the end of last year, um, a new methodology for distributed biochar was also approved at the same time. And this uses a DMRV um, system to, to real-time monitor the, the carbon um, output of, of biochar production. Um, and now we're in talks and discussions with various different methodology developers um, to, to approve and provide a pathway um, for yeah. their methodologies. That includes DAX, BEX, spikers, enhanced weathering. We're taking a, a keen interest in, mm -hmm. in the Catalyst program yeah. and what you guys are producing there um, to ensure a, a robust and reliable pathway to market yeah. for all these emergent methodologies. Sounds like a good shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at time, maybe also we should switch over to questions from the audience, or would we... We have, yeah, Go for let's it. do that. <laughs> let's do that. If you, if you have any questions to the panelists. You keep your hands up. <laughs> we find you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Cody Rossi with the NGO Clean Air Task Force. Um, I just have a governance question. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about storing carbon on these timescales to be climate relevant, we're going to have to be monitoring and verifying them for hundreds of years. So I wonder as to who you think um, and how best to manage the liability, who should be liable for it? Are we looking at governments? Are we looking at the buyer? Are we looking at the producer? And how best do we ensure that these frameworks that we develop today are continuously applied into the future so we can ensure that the removals that we do today don't end up being a ticking carbon time bomb for the future generation to deal with. Thanks. Great question. Yeah, go in. Yeah, I'll, I'll allude to your first point, which is about liability and, and so on. I think it's, it's a great discussion topic. Um, typically, how risk is, is treated in, in carbon markets, in my opinion, is very immature. Um, risk is uh, created at the issuer level. It's rated at the issuer level. And it's also underwritten at the issuer level. Um, what we really need to do now is take analogs from you know, financial markets and credit markets and start to decentralize those risk roles and responsibilities. Um, you know, we're talking about scaling this industry. In my opinion, finance and financial capital flows relative to our understanding and treatment of risk. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we can start to introduce new actors into the space, they're already starting to, m to emerge, B0, Silvera, we've got insurers in the room, um, also uh, new bodies like Kita, who are, who are taking on that risk. I think they play a, a key role. I think governments do as well. Um, you know, ultimately, carbon removal will form part of NDCs, so it's their responsibility to make sure that carbon that has been removed from the atmosphere ultimately stays sequestered mm -hmm. in whatever form it's, it's uh, stored or utilized in. Sounds like a great answer to me. You're happy as well. So let's have another one. Yes, hi everyone, this is Louis. I'm with Climeworks and happy to see a lot of discussion around the uh, MRV and standards. Um, that's a lot supply side uh, standards. And mm -hmm. when I look at the title that's above you, uh, we speak of a market and, and I would be curious from the panel to hear what kind of uh, demand side standards do we need? And mm -hmm. I believe that we need very stringent supply side standards, mm -hmm. but this is only half the picture, and I would be glad to hear mm -hmm. your view on that. Maybe 
if, if that's even things that you want to cover <laughs> in future, right? Yeah. yeah, I must say that you have the wrong person from Puro team uh, on stand. Uh, I look at the origination and uh, ICVCM. Uh, we have other colleagues who work with uh, VCMI and uh, SPTI. Uh, what and basically the the funnel has two claims. So there is the origination claim. The supplier claims that I have net removed this ton of carbon, and that is verified. Then there is the other claim from the buyer side. Typically, the compensation claim that with this carbon removal credit, I compensate these emissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing there I can say from my role is that. Uh, if you go to registry.pura.earth, you can see who has made the claim. So the buyer retirement is publicly, transparently visible there, and also the purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's as far as we are in that game of the other end of the claim. Otherwise, we are very much origination mm -hmm. focused. Yeah. yeah, I think very similar to Marianne, we're, we're more on the supply side. Um, integrity, but it's it's also very important that our instruments have market acceptance for um, entities like VCMI. Um, in the IREC market, as, as an example, um, a lot of our end users report to RE100, which is uh, an initiative of, of CDP, and it's up to them to define how um, IREX can, can be used for, for reporting their renewable energy consumption. I think the same will, will take shape um, for um, for carbon removal as well, SPTI, VCMI. Um, but it's not, not our role, I would no. say, to, to define how um, certificates get issued on our, our registry. It, it's really up to the demand side reporting mm. standards. You can create some transparency again. Yeah. Help, yeah, provide data. That's great. What else? I wonder, would it be a trouble to put the slide up that you started? I don't know if they can do it. <laughs> Let's see. Hey, team, could you put the slide up that we started? I feel so lucky that I can ask this question because I tried to make that map that you made, and I made a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and for each of you, I now have the privilege of asking, where are you on that map? Because for everybody, I could say, well, you're, you're that registry, but you're also the methodology developer but you're a little bit the marketplace. <laughs> and I wonder if you could just self-identify of, of like what box you're in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm just curious from your perspective, what boxes are missing? What companies do you wish somebody else would start mm -hmm. to, to enable the, the pipeline? Thank okay. you very much. Thank you for this question. <laughs> <It's> great. <laughs> yeah, maybe just the explanation for this is uh, when we started like uh, four years ago in Carbon Future and, and uh, others, there was nothing. And that means you have to design all of this and start with all of it. Mm -hmm. One stop and make it, make it work and step by step get it to independent parts. Mm -hmm. So you have the marketplace uh, as the Carbon Future and for, for example, what what is the tracking is like uh, as a certifier, we cannot develop it so f quickly. So w we need a partnership of someone who, who does the tracking from the factory to, this, to the sink side. But we need also the registry. Mm -hmm. so, so, so where are we here is ideally everybody is only one. Mm. But it, it, it takes some time uh, to get it clear and sometimes you can merge things. And, and you get different partners in it. And yeah, very much. Uh, thanks, Adam. And no, con <laughs> um, uh, you are okay to be confused. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is. Uh, when we started, we did it end to end. Uh, in May uh, 2019, we held an auction uh, because our uh, incubator had said that, will anybody buy this? And we had to prove that. Mm -hmm. So we had to be the marketplace to held on, hold an auction to find buyers, and luckily we did because we did get then the next uh, trench of uh, <laughs> financing. Uh, but uh, today we are the upper part. Uh, registry I see as a tool for um, 
the standard or the certification. So it's just a software piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, who runs it, uh, who develops it, of course, software developers are different. But for us, it's a tool where we host the certificates. Uh, otherwise, we are the, the standard, the methodology uh, hub and also overview of the uh, verifiers, so the VVPs mm -hmm. in this picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just speaking on um, my perspective, so Evident is the registry and C-Capsule is the standard. It's, it's applying um, the attribute tracking standard mm -hmm. specific to durable CDR. Um, I think it's also missing a few roles. I think this is a great start, but we believe in clear separation of roles and responsibilities wherever possible. Um, typically in carbon markets, the standard also issues the credit. What we believe is, is local implementation. So actually having local issuing bodies per country, whether that's government or government approved, doing the issuing, onboarding projects, processing issue requests. And then there's also emergent aspects uh, and actors um, that I touched on a little bit earlier about um, insurance bodies and rating agencies. Within our code, we have very much carved out a role um, for these new actors to emerge because we believe they play a, a critical role. We need to start decentralizing all the roles and responsibilities. Um, yeah, that's how we scale. Right. I think. Yeah. Beth, would you um, like to put us on the map? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we're. Yeah, on the on the bottom end of the of the diagram, so we're like the DMRV systems for like tracking and and translating removals, um, and then that's until the credit is created, and then we also have marketplace services. Um, that I mean, it can be us, and it can be other marketplaces as well. Um, but yeah, we sit in this DMRV system, and like Hans Peter was saying, like it's been uh, very interesting to see also how over time and interesting that you say also Adam like who who we like to see appear I think when this was started there were no players to have these independent bodies so mm -hmm. sometimes like the roles were like mixed and then now over time there's like new bodies appearing and so there's like the independent bodies and um, checks and balances coming into into play um, so it's good to see the the evolution and more like robustness of the transparency yeah. of the system yes this is basically what I would want to say as a, a summary of this. I think it's very encouraging to, to see that those different roles and responsibilities have really been claimed now and that we have a, a framework of, of hosting this big challenge that we have, that we have to be somewhat flexible and, and follow this very dynamic nascent market, or not even quite their market, and, and this very quick... <laughs> we, had, we, we heard uh, Jan Ming say that researchers will research and they will constantly do this and we'll have new evidence and we'll have new technologies and we have all those new developments and we have to deal with that. But, but I'm, I'm very confident that we can do it and that we can provide trust as we have different partners here who understand what each other's roles are and who can really focus on what they do best to, to complement each other. So thank you. We have one and a half minutes left for a, for a final statement. If you want, maybe just a quick wish to the audience. We have all the stakeholders here with whom you might engage. So what can they do to make your job more impactful or more fun? <laughs> Should I go? Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say to, I would have two messages, I'd be quick, um, to on the one hand dare and also be patient, which is a bit contradictory, <laughs> but um, nice. like dare in terms of like buyers to invest in this nation market to help, um, help it develop and create the supply that will be needed, like Jan mentioned, um, you know, we, we will need like gigatons of CDR, but we need to get the market there and so work with the uncertainty. So dare to engage early on mm -hmm. and at the same time be patient uh, with like the current uncertainties. The science is still being developed, so being patient in, in that sense as well. Um, mm -hmm. That would be my, my two things. Thanks. Yeah, I think patience is, is really important um, to make sure that we're you know, bringing quality to the market, um, not just quantity. But I think building on this theme of, of radical collaboration, you mm -hmm. know, 
see capsule evident, we want to promote a market where everyone has a role. So whether that's you know API integration into our registry to provide a marketplace or exchange or DMRV service, you know please feel free to reach out. Uh, if you're working on a new methodology, please let us know. Um, yeah, just get in touch. Happy Great. to talk. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, I was lucky that uh, three and a half years ago I was on a call. Uh, there was no carbon future yet, but uh, I was Matthias who was there and Hannes. And we were talking about carbon sinks. And what you see here now is what you get when you're there and when you do it right. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I can see both their and patients, but I would be more on the dare side. Uh, dare to develop projects, uh, dare to buy credits. Luckily, there are not so many uh, available <laughs> in the market, so you can just <laughs> dare to buy them, uh, start learning. It's like the uh, electric cars five years ago. There were not very many, but they were important. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's doing good, uh, not perfect, but clearly uh, helping the climate and uh, they're doing it now. Yes, well, wonderful. Thank you so much for this final statement round. Thank you for your time.